together. Reading from Luke 19, 28 through 38 today. Luke 19, 28 through 38. And as usual, I'll invite you to read along with me. In the back, if you could flip the slides while we read together, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Luke 19, 28 through 38. Would you read along with me God's word? After he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he had approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, let's begin Palm Sunday this way by echoing, uh, as we just read, the King who enters so echo with me. I'll say it once and then if you would, uh, just echo with me. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. All right, normally I'm not one like this, but can we, can we get a little, little more oomph to that? Blessed is the king who na- comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but sometimes in life you discover something, something that you didn't maybe know even existed, but once you discover it, you wonder, how did I ever live without this thing? Now, there's many, many examples of this, but one that kind of sticks out in my mind is the vacuum-insulated water bottle, of which I have one, and you've seen many of these. They're they're all over the place. Um, I know they feel like they've been around forever, but they actually haven't, literally in my lifetime. In 2015, I took a bunch of you students to Haiti uh, in the summer, and whenever you go to Haiti, one of the required items you have to bring is a water bottle, because if you drink the water, the tap water in Haiti, it's Pepto-Bismol City, okay? It's no good. Right? And so you have to drink the water that they filter and then they do those things, right? They clean it and do whatever, and that's what you have to do. Now, Haiti is really hot, right? Just like Houston. So in the summertime, right, you get ice cold water in the morning, you fill up your water bottles, you take it out to wherever you're going, and then you're with the water all day and you gotta drink a lot of water. All the physicians will tell us, if not, you'll get dehydrated. Well, the water, because it's really hot and it's not insulated, it's in a plastic bottle. Back in the day, we had bottles like this. It's called a Nalgene. You may not know what this is. Those were the thing back in the day. It's just plastic. They're indestructible. You put a lot of water in them, so on and so forth. But water, though it's cold in the beginning, will get warm very quickly. So some of our students did not drink a lot of water. They would drink a little bit in the morning, and then it would get hot, and then they wouldn't drink it. Then we'd get back to the campsite or whatever, and then they would drink a little bit later. And all in all, they're just not drinking a lot of water because they didn't want to drink hot water. Understandable to some degree. Well, this one particular student got severely dehydrated on day three, broke out in a cold sweat, and was knocked out for three days. Not good. But as this was happening, there was a team from Oklahoma, and they had bottles that looked like this. Literally, this was the exact same bottle. Black, nothing on it. And all I kept hearing was people in their group being like, I can't believe the water's still cold. We filled it up this morning and it's still cold. And it was like 2 p.m. And so I was like, what in the world? How is that possible? So I went up to them and I was like, what is this? And they're like, there's vacuum insulated bottles. You put the water in and it don't get warm for a long time. And I was like, Pfft. So that, I came home and to avoid this dehydration issue, I bulk ordered a bunch of water bottles from Arctic, which was a company at that time. I think they still make uh, water bottles, but they might not be well known anymore. And I forced everyone on our teams next year to buy one, period, because you had to have it. And now we basically look at it and go, how do we ever live without one of these things, particularly in a city like Houston? How do we ever drink warm water all the time, right? We only have cold water. Now, a little caveat, right? Obviously, not these types of things that in our life, we don't need them per se all the time, but there are indeed things that will change your life once you discover. How did I ever live without this thing? It makes life so much more convenient or easy, and there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different things. Um, the wireless charging is another one. How do we ever plug the phone into the, like, you know, things of that nature? 
Well, as you see the sermon title this morning, you're probably trying to make the connection. Okay, cool story, Pastor Pete, but what does that have to do with Jesus? How is Jesus, as you're saying, how is he the king that we didn't know we needed? I'm pretty certain that we know that we need him. We wouldn't be here otherwise, most of us anyway. Well, the reason why is because the more and more I looked at Holy Week, and the more and more I followed with Luke throughout Holy Week, the more and more I realized that in many ways the king that I thought I knew or the king that we think we know throughout Holy Week might not be the king that you actually read about in the text. That is not actually the same in some ways. The biggest details are all fairly clear to everybody. Jesus enters riding on a donkey. They praise his name. Although there's no palms in the Luke version, it's only in the John version, They, they, they glorify him as king. Then he goes to the week and he does some of these things. And then, of course, he's crucified on Friday. Good Friday, then he's resurrected on Sunday. But outside of those major details, in many ways the Jesus I was encountering in the scripture just didn't line up with maybe the Jesus that most of us in the West and Christianity and churches know. For instance, did you know that as Jesus rides in this morning on Palm Sunday, the only people that actually crown him as king is the disciples and the crowd that were journeying with him. He is utterly and flat out rejected by the entire city of Jerusalem. No one from the city itself comes out to greet him. Those who turn on him and say crucify him are the people in the city. The disciples, Luke's exact words, is the crowd of the disciples. But no important official from Jerusalem, no religious elite, no one from them came out to greet him, which means they did not consider him anything but a nobody. This was not a royal entrance to the people of Jerusalem. And Jesus makes that clear, and he understands it, and they indeed see it. In many ways, the more and more you look at this week, the more and more you realize that this week is one of the most confusing and confounding weeks ever lived in the history of the planet, it feels like. Actually, if you read, it's, it's kind of like a comedy of errors. It's just all over the place. You can't really make sense of anything, and, and hopefully all that will kind of come together. The week, if you put it all together, is really difficult to piece together. Like, what is actually going on here? So then as I thought about it, and I was sitting through it and reading Something jumped out at me from the text that I remember. I've been trying to read the entire book of Luke as many times as I can throughout the season just to get in, just to embed myself in their narrative. And all of a sudden, this thing popped into my mind. It was Luke chapter 8, verse 10. You may know this. This is after Jesus tells them the first parable, the parable of the sowers, the seeds, and the soil, right? We all know this. And right after, the disciples are like, I don't get it, Jesus. Explain. And this is how he answers them. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables. So that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. The capital words there are not emphasis. It's a quote from Isaiah chapter 6. In your Bibles, and particularly in the NASB, the reason why we read it, one of the reasons anyway, is that whenever you see the capital letters, it's a quote from the Old Testament. And this is Isaiah chapter 6. And this idea is woven throughout Scripture all the way through that just because you saw something with your eyes doesn't actually mean that you understand it or actually saw it, saw it for real. That just because you heard something with your ears and it came in didn't mean that you actually understood it. There's a lot of examples of this in life all over the place. If you've ever been to a symphony orchestra, if you're not an orchestral type, it may sound cool to you, but you don't really appreciate it, do you? Definitely not like the BTS concert or the Blackpink concert or whatever other concert that you may go to. New Jeans, that's the, that's the new band, right? That's cool. I went to Cirque du Soleil not too long ago. And as Christina will testify, there was the body contortionist. There's two ladies. They were doing things with their body. I'm telling my mom, I was like, oh! I was like making audible noise. It was crazy. Like they were bending their bodies and doing all these types of things. And the reason why is because as I get older and as I try to exercise and do these, I realize how insanely difficult the things they are doing. So my body was like, I was like feeling things in my body being like, ooh, that's not supposed to happen. There was this one move, literally, I kid you not. She was bending backwards like this and then she did a bridge that I cannot do, and then the other girl stood on top of her stomach and then did another, I I was, what is going on? I felt like I was understanding a little bit of what they're going through. Had I seen that in college, I'd be like, okay, cool. But you don't really see it. It happens all the time. I witnessed open heart surgery one time. I don't really know what that's all about. People who've come anywhere close to that field in the medical field, they know what that's all about, how, you know, all that stuff. Just because you see something doesn't mean that you actually saw it. Just because you heard something doesn't mean that you actually heard it. In many ways, in seeing, it was told so that you would see and not see, and hear and not understand. 
This idea, Paul says in Ephesians 1.18, he says it like this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of glory of his inheritance in the saints. If we really want to see God, Paul suggests, we need a second pair of eyes, the eyes of our heart. And not only do we need a second pair of eyes, someone needs to enlighten them, give them light, turn them on, if you will, for us to see. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 that that person or the thing, the agent that turns the lights on is the Holy Spirit. And then I saw this in the text that we just read, chapter 19. The crowd of disciples, again, not the city, the crowd who's traveling with Jesus, who praised him, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, did so for all the miracles and signs that they saw. Only the people who had seen his miracles praised him as king. The holy city of Jerusalem, who at this point is expecting a Messiah of some kind. It is a, para- is a pa- fast- Passover feast. This is a time, if anything, any time the Messiah was going to come and be declared, it was at this time, but they had not seen. There's a text in Luke chapter 13. Some of the Pharisees go up to Jesus and go, Hey, Jesus, uh, Jesus, you should get out of here. Why? Because Herod's trying to kill you. Jesus has this interesting comment. Oh, don't worry about that fox. That word fox is not sly or slick. That word is worthless nobody, as we'll see a little later. Don't worry about him. I'm not worried about him. I'm going to Jerusalem anyway. That's where I was going. And then he says this. For it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. Verse 34. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and the stones, those who sent her. How often I wanted to gather your children just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Those who proclaimed Jesus king on the way in had seen Jesus as king before he entered. Therefore, they affirmed Jerusalem had not yet seen. And therefore, they turned their backs on him. So this idea of seeing and not seeing is woven all throughout, particularly in Luke. That to see means to believe in Luke. So that just because you see doesn't mean that you'll believe. You'll see it on Good Friday. Many people saw what happened, and only some believed and trusted. On Resurrection Sunday, you'll see many people saw the empty tomb, but what they saw is depending on whether the eyes of their hearts were indeed enlightened. And so I think all of this, in many ways, begs the question, what is it that those who saw, saw, for real, for real, what is it that they saw? And for those who saw but didn't see, why not? And then the question for us, it seems, What is it that we need to see so that we would indeed see and live? My prayer for us as we go forward this day and this week is that the Spirit would open the eyes of your heart to see the King which you were meant to see and believe. To then praise Him the way you were meant to praise Him. And then in seeing, you would believe. And in believing, you would have life now and forever. Here are the three questions, as that is a backdrop that we'll go through to kind of understand. What did they see? What did Jesus see? And what is it that we need to see? First, what did they see? The they here is the people of Jesus' time, okay? People who are actually there to physically see what went down. Now, as I suggested earlier, everything that they saw in many ways was confounding, to say the least. It's just that we may not think that way. It's not as linear as you think. It's not like Jesus enters and then he dies. That's not how this works, actually. If you compare, this is just... And so as I saw it, what I did was I I contrasted the looks of Jesus, what you find in just the book of Luke, not even the other Gospels. And this is what I found. Because on one hand, Jesus emphatically, confidently, boldly proclaims, I am the King. I am the Son of God, the Messiah. He does not hesitate to proclaim who he is. Bold. But on the other hand, he's so despondent, agonized, that he sweats blood and other things. And so I just looked again at the book of Luke and I kind of just compared and conscious these things because sometimes what you get is not really what you see. Here's the bold, the godly, the kingly Jesus you see in Luke, just in Luke. Again, Luke chapter 13. Hey Jesus, Herod's trying to kill you. And he's like, that fox, I ain't worried about him. That nobody, that poser, that nobody. I'm not worried about him. Those words are from a commentary. 
He calls him a poser, a weakling, a nobody. Luke 9 and others, he continues, says, I'm going to Jerusalem, that's where I'm going, and I'm going to be betrayed, handed over to the leaders, and they're going to kill me and betray me. Luke 19, 27, just before the entry that we read, he's telling this parable, he's telling these stories about who's going to enter, and he says this in verse 27, but these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. That's what kings do. Then he says, go into the village, you're going to find a colt that no one has ridden on. Get it and bring it back to me. And if somebody asks you what you're doing, just say, the Lord has need of it. So cool. That's it. That's all you need to say. No reason, no nothing. The Lord has need of it. By the way, the reason why the colt had to be an unridden colt is because in those days, no king would ever ride on another person's animal. It had to be an unridden animal given to a kingly person. He's the king, he's saying. If they wonder why you're taking it, tell them the king needs it. And they'll understand. And they do. The disciples declare, blessed is the king. From chapter 13 to here 19, they change it. Not blessed is the one. Blessed is the king. Later on, when he's being tried in front of the Sanhedrin, he says to them, but from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they ask him, so then are you the Son of God? And he goes, yes, I am. Flat out. So bold, so kingly, so godly, so confident in who he is. And yet, on the other hand, in the same breath it seems, so distraught, so despondent, broken, vulnerable, and humble. Though he rides in on a horse, on a donkey, he rides in on a donkey, not on a war horse. He gets to the city that he knows is going to kill him in mere days, reject him flat out, and yet when he sees it, what does he do? He weeps. In the garden, we know this scene. Remove this cup from me, O God, he says, but yet not my will, and yet yours be done. He is in such agony at this point, knowing that God is going to reject him, that angels come to minister to him. That doesn't happen a whole lot in his life. It happens when he's in the wilderness in the beginning, as Satan is tempting him for 40 days. It happens here. Angels are strengthening him just so he can get through, and yet he's still sweating blood in agony. It is insane in some ways. Before his accuser, he doesn't say much, just as Isaiah 53 prophesied. He lets them beat him, mock him, whip him, and yet nothing. You'll see on Friday that he's so beaten and bruised and battered that he doesn't have the strength to carry his own cross. That's why they get Simon to do it. And of course, while hanging on the cross... Betrayed by the people that he knew was going to do so, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He saves one of the criminals who's justly being crucified, and then at the end he says, Into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. If you actually put the two together, it's quite confusing. Who is this man? You see, if any other human being actually acted this way, I think we would look at him and say, That dude is crazy. Bipolar, maybe. Most kings in history do not behave like this. Most of your heroes in stories and legends and movies certainly do not behave like this. Yes, there are portraits of them in which they act in a more tender. You see the tender side of them, you'll say, but none of them would do what Jesus did when they are threatened, pushed, and physically attacked, you see? Anyone, any leader, any hero, when they're pushed to that place, what do they do? They get ready. They armor up. They battle. They fight. But Jesus does not do anything close to this. He doesn't even get angry at the blatant rejection of Jerusalem, the holy city that's supposed to be expecting him, the one who literally don't show up to the gate. Rather, he weeps. He doesn't go into battle worn, like armed with, so with swords and weapons. No, he heals the ear of the dude who's arresting him that Peter gets mad and cuts the ear off. He heals it before he goes and stops doing these things. He goes, by the way, let me tell you, you're not capturing me because you think you're cool. You're only capturing me because the hour of the enemy is here. I'm letting you do it. Go ahead, take me. Can you imagine what's actually going on in the minds of the people who are walking with him through this week? It's not as clear, I think, as it means. If I'm the disciple, I'm going, wait, what are you actually doing here, bro? You're actually going to just let them take you? Like, for real? You're not going to put up a fight? You're going to heal this dude? He's here to arrest you. They're going to kill you in a minute. 
At least fight. Do something. You don't fight for your life. You're called a weakling. Sorry for the semi-insensitive or offensive language. If you're a man in this situation, you're called something other than a man. Unmanly. He doesn't do any of those things. The folks in Jerusalem got to be thinking, wait, 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 wait. This dude is supposed to be something? He's supposed to be dangerous? He don't look nor feel dangerous to me. And then even Pilate and Herod, they just want him to give him something. Say something to me. Open your mouth and tell me what you are. I have the power to free you. I don't think you're guilty, but you won't say nothing. And Jesus goes, I don't got nothing to say. And to make sure, no one ever then expected Jesus to resurrect. It is not a thing that exists. Just like I didn't know vacuum-sealed water bottles existed 10 years ago, it was not a thing. The Romans did not have a concept of this idea of resurrection, and the Jews certainly did not expect a resurrection in that time. They expected a later one. In the day of the Lord, the atonement at the end. And yet, Jesus is who he is. He's declaring, I'm both of these things. All at the same time, this is who I am. I am king and I am Messiah, but I am the humble king and Messiah. I am indeed the savior of the world, but I'm a suffering savior. Don't you forget it. And I am indeed the son of God, the beloved whom he loves, but I am the rejected son that the father will turn his back on so he doesn't have to turn his back on you and me. This past Thursday at early morning prayer, if you know, the last two weeks before Easter and Christmas, we always have a special morning prayer. And on Thursday, he said this. He said, there's a song that we all know. It's in Korean. I'll sing it for you in a second. He goes, you know that song? 당신은 사랑받게 위해 And the translation is, you are a person born to be loved, to receive love. And he goes, everyone on earth deserves that song but one, and his name is Jesus, because he was born to be cursed. The King of all kings, the Son of God, hailed by the shepherds as the Savior of the world in his birth, born not to be loved, but to be cursed and rejected. That's what they saw. Church, what is it that we're seeing when we see this Jesus? Who is it that we're encountering when we encounter him this week? I didn't announce this earlier. I, I, I forgot both services. But today there will be an email going out with a suggested reading for each day of this week in the book of Luke as we've been traveling. My suggestion to you is if you are able to read each day and travel along with him and ask yourself, what it is? Who is it that I'm seeing? The next, what is it that Jesus saw? Have you ever wondered what Jesus is thinking, what's going on in his mind, what he's envisioning in his eyes? Now, I can admit and say no one's going to really know because we aren't him. None of us are fully God and fully man, so we can't ever really get at it. But I think we can somewhat understand what he's thinking through what the text tells us. To get a glimpse of what he saw and therefore what he felt and understood. As I said, all scholars agree that Luke, without a shadow of a doubt, wants us to know one thing about all of this this week. is He is the king. The theme of king is everywhere throughout the text. And everything he does, even going up to the Mount of Olivet and coming down, all of it is fulfilling the prophecies of old in Zechariah 9, 14, Psalm 118, so on and so forth. In chapter 9, he announces he's going to Jerusalem, and that is his goal. And every single step of the way, he's going, I'm going to Jerusalem. You're not going to stop me. I'm going there. This is what I'm doing. We saw chapter 13 earlier. I'm going there. I know what's going to happen, and you will not stop it. What's clear is that Jesus understands his kingliness, and he understands his mission, that he's going to indeed do this thing. He's not entering this Sunday trying to convince people he's king. He's saying, I am, whether you like it or not. I have been, I am, and I will be. But at the same time, Jesus makes it clear that though he is king, he's not entering like any normal king. There are no war horses. He did not conquer anyone. He didn't defeat anyone. There's no salutations and none of that. He's being hailed by a bunch of poor people and people that don't matter in the city of Jerusalem. And he says, I've made it clear. I've come to divide more than unite, as you think, goats and sheep. And this entry proclaims with authority that indeed that is what he's doing. People, some are going to notice that I'm king. Others are not going to notice. And that's going to make a difference. 
David Garland, a theologian, says, Jesus enters Jerusalem as the messianic king, and his coming as Lord brings joy or calamity, depending on how he is received. Just before that Luke 13 text that we looked at where he says, hey, Pharisees say, hey, Herod's trying to kill you. Someone asks Jesus in the crowd and he says, hey, Lord, are there just a few who are going to be saved? Like, how many of us are going to really be saved? And this is how he responds. It's fascinating. He goes, "Um, first, the door to enter to be saved is very narrow. Many will seek it, but will not be able to enter. And then he said, then after, the door is going to close. And the many will get to the door and start knocking and banging on the door and saying, Lord, let us in. Lord, let us in. Lord, let us in. And he'll say what? I don't know you. And the door's not opening. So what is it that Jesus sees if you put all this together? I think he sees that indeed it seems as no one does actually understand what is going to happen that week. Everyone seems to be lost. No one sees why he's actually going to Jerusalem. Even the disciples, again, they're not the ones who turn their back and yell, crucify him, but they infamously turn their back on him too, Peter being the most infamous one. Jesus tells him, this is how you're going to die me, and he does it exactly as is. He sees betrayal coming, and the people are lost. He sees the people of Israel and the world, since and forever perhaps, will always see the world differently than the way that he sees it. They see it, we see it, the world has always seen the world where power rules, conquering is victory, where if you want to establish yourself, you need to have power, overthrow, and be bigger. I think he sees that no one really understands that true winning isn't by defeating, it is by being defeated, that winning is by peace, and peace is not found in strength and or forcing it, but in weakness through voluntary death. Clearly he sees that Jerusalem is confused. Because they want Rome's help to defeat him. So they'll side with Rome. And indeed, Rome will defeat him, quote-unquote. But they don't realize that not too long from then, Rome will overthrow Jerusalem. They sided with the wrong side. But through it all, I think, I think what Jesus sees is he sees a world that needs a king. And not just any king, but this king. A king who boldly declares his kingship but does it in a way that no one has ever and no one will ever do again. I think Jesus sees a people who need saving and those who indeed will unwittingly without even knowing it do the very thing that needs to be done to save them which is to turn their back on him so that he may serve as the perfect sacrifice for the sin that they don't know they have and the sin that they're blind to see. And I think Jesus then finally sees the joy that is set before him, knowing that what he's about to do is going to indeed save the world, but at the same time, he knows that what he's going to do is going to be painful. It is not easy. So then, what is it that we need to see? We've been long talking about in this Lent series that the kingdom that we're encountering throughout, oops, went too far, is the backwards, upside down, improbable kingdom. We talked about it before, if you remember from very way back, that what we're hoping for in our prayer throughout the series is that you would indeed anticipate the proper king in the kingdom. Because if you anticipate and therefore Jesus delivers on your anticipations and your expectations will indeed be high. Do you remember those graphs? I didn't put them on there uh, today, but I think and I hope you remember. Well, that great reversal comes front and center during this final week of Jesus' life. Because this is the week where death brings life. Where the cross leads to the resurrection. Where darkness leads to eternal light. And get this, where betrayal leads to joy. I think the people who saw this week and therefore believed are the ones who saw the great reversal as the truth and received it. That indeed, this is the kingdom that we need and this is the true king that we truly need. Michael Wilcox, summarizing Luke chapter 6, that's Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Luke's version. 
He summarizes this way. He says, In the life of God's people will be seen, first of all, a remarkable reversal of values. Check this sentence out. They will prize what the world calls pitiable and suspect what the world thinks desirable. You see, the kingdom, Jesus tells us, is the one that begins with a denial of yourself, which the world doesn't tell you to do, and then the crucifixion of self, right? Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and then follow me. That's how the kingdom begins. This kingdom is one where Joseph realized everything that the world meant for evil, his family, and that evil, if you remember, is him being sold as a slave, being left for dead, lied to his father that he was dead, falsely accused of rape, then imprisoned, all of that God used so that indeed not only does he save Egypt, but his family. And in the end, he says, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. This kingdom is a king, his kingdom with the king, who uses the very rejection and murder of the chosen people and the greatest reversal to bring life, joy, and peace, not just for those chosen people, but to everyone that they hated. Over and over and over again, you will see as a king who will be exactly who he needs to be for us and for the world, one that does not do anything the way that the world says needs to be done. So then, what do we really need to see I think we need to see that this king wins by being rejected rather than by being heralded. Because he was rejected, he goes to the cross. And because he goes to the cross and is rejected by his father also on the cross, he satisfies the wrath of his father towards sin, paying the price so that we could all be saved and be free. We need to see that I think the king that we're meeting this week is one who is humble and that his true power, more than his might, more than all these things, is his humility and his meekness. You see, although Jesus knows that his life is at stake, he never wavers and he never falters from the plan. This is what they've always wanted, he and his father. I find it fascinating that he knows he's the resurrection and the life. Right? He tells people, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. And yet, he's in agony because of all these different things, but through it all, he is who he is. He never wavers. He trusts his father. Why? Because he believes his father will deliver. Throughout Luke, you'll find that once he tells people he's going to Jerusalem, he keeps telling them, by the way, I'm not going to die because of you. I'm not going to die because a stupid city that should receive me as king doesn't receive me and reject me. No, I'm dying because this was the plan. And I will die and I will do it indeed. Why? Because my father and I, we had a plan and he will come through. I trust him. That trust is humility. To trust in the greater plan that indeed God has something that the world doesn't know. He dies so that indeed he is the ransom for many because that was his mission. That was the plan. And I think that's why we see his tears and his agony and his anguish. Why? Because though there's joy set before him for the thing he's about to do, he's going to be separated from the one person he doesn't know separation from. An agony he's never felt, but he knows he needs to do it. Not because he knows he's going to resurrect, but because indeed he knows his father loves him. We follow this king because we believe that he loves us. That the price of sin is death. I think we need to see a king that indeed knows this agony because we have a lot of it too. And following this road with Christ is one that indeed will have it as he tells us indeed it will be. This week I found myself wondering, and I don't know if you've ever wondered this, but I kept wondering, what would any other king and or ruler and or power or authority who knew what Jesus knew heading into this final week, what would they have done? Anyone? Well, I surmise that they would have gotten ready for battle. They would have drawn up a battle plan. Here's my enemy. They would have known, as Jesus does, that he's greatly outnumbered in, pure, in terms of pure numbers. 
And because he knows that usually in a fight, the people with greater power and strength and numbers, they win, he would have then been anxious, worried, antsy. But because he's the king or he's a ruler and he's a battle warrior, he's going to have to show false bravado, a sense of confidence that he doesn't actually have. But inside, he would have been dying and most likely driving himself crazy. Why? Because if he knows that the very people he's going to go to war with are supposed to be his people that he's actually ruling, it's an insurrection. Then he would have had feelings of betrayal and things and all that would have been, that scorn would have continually drove, driven him and that kind of angst would have built up and built up and then his heart would have been broken and shattered and then he would have reacted the only way a broken and shattered heart do and that's in bitterness and in fear and in protection. Well, if they're going to try to kill me, guess what? I'm going to take them out before they can tell me they don't know who I am. And then by getting on the offensive, it would have ended did with a lot of pain and death. Even if that king survived, many would have died. But our king, because he dies, no one else needs to die. He says, that's not the way you win. That's not the way to peace. Everyone is going to say this is weak. You'll see it on Good Friday. Literally people mock him. You'll see it on Friday. They mock him. If you're the king, save yourself. What kind of king can't save himself? I'm giving away on Friday. You know why it's good? Because he doesn't save himself and he saves everyone else along the way. He knows that laying his life down is the only way to finally defeat death. And not only death, but the fear that comes with death. I think we teach our children all the time, young ones, hey, you know what? If you want to really understand bullying and hatred and things like that, you have to show them, don't react to their comments, don't react to their things. Trust in your heart that you're loved. Someone tells you you're not this, trust that you are indeed. Someone tells you you're not beautiful, you're not smart enough, you're not this enough, know that you're a person made in the image of God. Trust it and believe it, then you don't have to react. And if you don't react, then they'll stop bothering you because they can't get a reaction out of you. We tell them that. Well, Jesus says, death? Everyone else reacts to death in the same way. Before you get to me, I'm going to get to you, sucker. But he says, no, go ahead and bring it. And I will show you that I will conquer it by letting it happen. Then you'll know that you will have nothing to fear. Death dies because Jesus submits to it and says, hmm, I'll just walk out three days later. Rejection dies because he took on the rejection of his father for the sake of the people. And then his father raised him up, Philippians 2 says, to be seated on the right hand of God and everybody will exalt his name. He says, death? I'm going to walk out. And all of you who believe and follow will never die but live. Because the way you win is to let everyone take their shot and realize their shot has nothing. This is the king that we need. Because otherwise you and I will fight our entire lives to battle the world as they tell us to and we will lose every step of the way. As we finish, I'm going to read uh, two quotes, one by C.S. Lewis and Tim Keller. They'll be on the screen. And, but before we do, I'm going to pray for us. My prayer is that this week, that you would cry out with your heart, Lord, help me to see what I need to see. Enlighten my eyes. Maybe some of you have been feeling the way that I've been feeling at times. It's just another Holy Week, another Easter. It's just going to go by. We're going to do our thing. Come to worship, yes. Do Good Friday, yes. And then Resurrection Sunday, yes. But it won't do much. But God promises us that once you've seen, Psalm 34, taste and then see. And if you've tasted and then seen, you will never want to taste or see anything else ever again. For this is the spring of life. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord. We want to pray. And then couple quotes that hopefully you'll ruminate over and then in doing so 
that you will then find. I hope you see this king that our hatred killed, that he took to then save us from our own hatred and sin. So we're going to pray, then read these quotes, and then give you some time to reflect. Praise team, take your time. I hope you would reflect too. No pressure to get up here really soon. We can just play the pads in the back. And then church, will you, by the Spirit, have your eyes be opened to see the King that we need? Let me pray and then I'll read the quotes. Lord God, Spirit, would you do that which we cannot do? Would you open the eyes of our heart so that we would see you? And in seeing you, believe. And in believing, have life. You take all of our best shot, an eternity of sin, it seems, and you defeat it once and for all on the cross, and you declare that death indeed, no longer has any power. Lord, many of us have been blinded by many things, our sin primarily, but we ask that you would open our eyes, that we would see this King, the humble King, the good King, the holy King, the righteous King, the one who wins in weakness, humility. So Lord, be praised. Help us to draw near to you this week. Help our eyes to believe that which we see, that the world is not what we think it is. And that indeed, your defeat on the cross was not defeat at all. It was victory. And then help us to glorify you. For there is no other king like you. Not never, not now, or forever. Amen. Hear the quotes first by C.S. Lewis. This principle runs through all life from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. And Tim Keller. Christians then see that in Jesus the way up is down. And the way to true power is to give up power in order to serve. The way to true riches is to be radically generous with all you have. And the way to lasting happiness is not to seek your own happiness so much as the happiness of others. That was how he saved the world and changed your life. And now it becomes our way of seeing and living. I think Jesus is indeed the king that we didn't know we needed. But without the Spirit opening our eyes, we will not see him. But again, I pray that you would see and taste. Taste and see. And then you'll wonder, how did I ever live without him? And then I hope you realize, I never did, because without him you're not living. But with him, there's life now and forever. Blessings to you, O oh people. That though you reject him, he saves you. And by your rejection, he saves the world. Receive him. See with your eyes. Pray that they will be opened. And then have life, now and forever. Take some time to respond. Commune with him. And then, in a little bit, We'll sing together. And praise team, I really apologize, but if we could sing the song we just sang at the last part and then finish with Hosanna, that would be really great. Respond, and then we'll sing together. Happy Palm Sunday. Blessed be his name. Blessed is the one who comes 